Hey VC, it's Gary. I'm back. Uh, I know I promised to give you a day off, but um, it's not today. Maybe tomorrow. Um, so I, oh, pardon me. I thought I just heard some groaning there for a second. Um, you know, I, I've got a bunch of artists planned that I want to do videos for, and I can't find... You know, the funny thing is, is I can find 90% of the things that I want to show, whether they're CDs or vinyl. Um, but that other like 10% or in some cases it's just a single album, um, I can't find and it's one of the crucial ones that I want to show. And it's preventing me from doing uh, videos on multiple artists, including one I was going to do on an entire record label, uh, which is, doesn't exist anymore, the IC Innovative Communications label. Um, and that was probably going to be, or will be, when I do get around to it and I find the missing CDs, um, a not-too-flattering portrait of the label. So be prepared for that one. Um, so what I got today is I went through a huge bin of um, compact discs, and I found a bunch of things um, that I was looking for, that I didn't know where they were, including some albums that I forgot that I bought. That's very rare that I forget I buy an album. I f found a... Um, bunch of Charles Lloyd albums, including one of the ECM ones, I totally forgot I purchased, which is very unusual for me, until I realized that, um, I don't know if any of you guys remember the old Columbia House Record Club, which was in existence for many years, well into the CD era, and they kind of, when they went out of business, it kind of morphed into the BMG Music Service, which is also gone, but I stayed a member of that. Not the, the the prices stunk. I mean, they were charging you know full list price for something, um, tax, sales tax, shipping and handling. So CDs were like seventeen ninety eight. Shipping and handling add a few bucks onto that. Tax add a couple bucks onto that, and like a single CD would be twenty something dollars for a domestic, easily available CD. The reason I stayed a member, however, was their sales that they had. Um, and for the price of shipping and handling, they would sell a lot of CDs for like a dollar ninety nine. So uh, what's that comparable to now? Well, this is really before Amazon took off. Nowadays, you could find that um, maybe through Amazon sellers uh, you know, on, on occasion on, on certain albums, you can find some very inexpensive new sealed copies. But this was a little bit prior to, to, I guess, Amazon really taking off, or at least having um, sellers that, that would sell those things. And I'm coming across now, I'm wondering why, in some cases, I have two copies of a CD or something, and I'm looking and I'm seeing this little BMG um, sticker, not a, not a sticker, but they would actually print it on the label. They would reproduce the, the CD exactly in full, but there would be a slight change on the logo, uh, like would say, you know, ECM Records, but there'd be this line under there, you know, manufactured by BMG under license, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I don't know if any of you folks were around in that era, uh, but I got, you know, it was good for experimental buying, certainly in the days before Amazon. And um, extra points if you notice right where I'm pointing there. Some of the CDs that I pulled out of one of my big plastic bins are finally making it onto the shelf there. Um, and if you look over there, man, I cannot coordinate this. Woo -hoo. Here we go. Okay. Those two shelves right there, of those three, that little cubicle thing there. Um, those first two shelves right there are actually all my Oregon and Oregon related CDs right there. Just the, the first two. So there's Oregon and then there's the solo projects of uh, the four main guys and also uh, Tree Lock Gertu. Um, so those are, those are all, so I know, always know where my, and Ralph Towner solo albums. Uh, yeah, those are there too. Um, so at least I know where those are, but I'm not, you know, I haven't done an Oregon thing. Um, did I? No, I don't think I did. And uh, the guys that I want to do, I just, I'm missing like one or two vital pieces. Whatever, whatever. So today I'm going to do a relatively short one. Uh, this is not, once again, this is not a career overview type of thing. This is more my personal experience with, with an artist. And uh, I'm doing Carla Bly today, and I'm doing Steve Swallow because the two of them have been interconnected for a lot of years. Um, and I'm just showing the few albums I have by her. Um, and whatever, you know, whatever, whatever facts come up in the process, um, starting with my vinyl. Here's the only one I don't have, I haven't repurchased on CD because I missed it. This is one of those I could have put in my um, albums that I missed the CD release because it came out on CD and I missed it. And, uh, you know, it's not necessarily one of my favorite favorites, but it seems like this, this period of hers, um, this is from 81, I think. 
Yeah, January 81, this is from. Um, you know, her writing's a little tough for people to get into. It's even tough for me to get into. Uh, she tends to play with, with big bands most of the time. And I, I wouldn't say I'm not a fan of big bands, but I, I like smaller, intimate ensembles where you could hear what each musician is doing. This is, in a way, the total opposite of that. Uh, much of her writing is... Uh, her, her, her albums, I should say, are very much written out pieces. You know, there's there's solos, but uh, you know, there's you know, with with the big horn sections and stuff like that, all those parts have to be written out. And um, I guess one of my favorite things in the world aren't big brassy bands. I guess it's just a, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just for whatever reason, not my thing. Like I said, I prefer the, the more intimate um, things. And there's um. How many musicians on? Here's about eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine. Well, nine. You know, eight was a good guess. Nine musicians on here make up the primary band. This is for, um, social studies. This is the only one I didn't get on on CD, and I missed it. Went out of print, and they're commanding ridiculous prices for it now. Uh, so it's got euphonium player, which is fairly interesting. Tuba player, just about my least favorite instrument in the world. Um, Carla herself plays organ and piano, as she does on most of her albums. Um, she still plays old-fashioned organ. She never really switched to like synthesizers or anything, um, but you know, acoustic piano and organ. Tony DeGrotti plays on here. Uh, you know, fairly well known, I guess I would say. You know, maybe during the '80s. Um, who else? Carlos Wood, another saxophone player. Michael Mantler, who was married to Carla Bly. I don't know at the time, but um, you know they were for a whole bunch of years. And when they split up, they stopped working together. So my tendency to think is that they, they may have been together here. This kind of might be the end of their uh, relationship. And Michael went out, off on his own to record uh, albums and no longer even lives in the U.S. He left the U.S., I believe. Uh, and Steve Swallow on bass. Steve Swallow became Carla's partner right around this time or just after this time and the two of them have been in, inseparable ever since and pretty much always play on each other's albums uh, almost always so that's social studies big band thing kind of like a big band thing but her writing is um, I find a bit angular a bit um, not dissonant but but um, it's totally unpredictable so if you want to hear something where you don't know where it's going this is where you put on she's a very imaginative writer now the rest of these that I'm going to show you I have on, on, also on CD. Um, this one is January, uh, let me see, record, recorded December 86 and January 87. Um, called the Bly Sextet. So it's a little bit of a smaller band, six piece band. Um, and I kind of like this a lot better. Uh, these next three that I'm showing. You know, even though I don't, I, I, I don't have a, you know, even a decent sampling of her career, but the next three are really the favorite ones that I'm showing. Um, this has Carla only playing organ, interestingly enough, not playing piano on here, a very unusual. Um, Larry Willis is playing piano, so it's odd that she hired a pianist. Steve Swallow on bass, from this point on, even prior to this, Steve Swallow is going to be on all her albums. Uh, Victor Lewis on drums, and Don Elias on percussion. I love Don Elias, who passed away a few years ago. Um... Also on the next three albums I'm going to show, which were pretty much recorded back to back in the mid '80s, is uh, guitarist Hiram Bullock. Now I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he was the original guitarist for David Letterman's band. I don't know how many years he was with them, but he was with them for several years. Um, I didn't really watch David Letterman much, but the first two years I watched his show in the early '80s when he first came on, and um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see the picture. He's the first guy there. Ooh. I gotta get this thing down with moving my fingers, you know. It's a, there's Hiram Bullock, and there's Steve Swallow, and there's Don Elias, who also passed away, and there's Carla last. Um, Hiram Bullock was an interesting choice for her band because he was one guy. Uh, I'm sure he could read music, or else he wouldn't have been on David Letterman's band. But he had a very aggressive rock style, which is totally not with the kind of music Carla Bly would play. And yet she used him for quite a few of her albums, at least the, th the next three I'm going to show you, if not more. Um, and the weird thing is, is because so much of her music is written out, even with even in the smaller band context, in the six piece that's here, um, and the mu the music itself is a little weird, but it's certainly not aggressive jazz rock at all. And having Hiram Bullock's guitar on there 
it's really weird. You know, it's really effective, you know? And I'm the last guy to say, you know, oh, let's hire a rock guy to come and stomp all over these, you know, very carefully crafted compositions. And yet his aggressive playing, because he almost always played the same, no matter what situation he was in, he was like a rock player. Um, and I think because the Carla Bly stuff, as angular as the music is, it didn't really have kind of like an aggression to it, or doesn't, I should say, she's still very active. Um, and bringing Hiram Bullock on, which would just be, an, you know, conceptually an odd choice, really brings something out on these records. Um, and actually just through hearing him from this, because I had only heard him in the Letterman band, um, where he played that same way, no matter what you heard him play. Uh, I bought some of his solo discs and just didn't... Well, first of all, his solo discs went in a much more commercial direction. He actually sang and wrote kind of like R&B style songs. And, and there wasn't a whole lot of guitar soloing. And, you know, they were all just song songs, you know, just not really uh, instrumental pieces so much uh, from most of them I heard. So I was kind of disappointed in the, the few albums of his I sampled. I wonder if any of you guys do this. Um... I used to always, and I've got tons and tons of albums, that when I would buy an album, this is back in the retail store days, I would save the receipt. That, that's actually the receipt. I usually stick it inside the album. And it wasn't so much to return the album if it was defective, you know, because that would be something that you would find out right away and return. But um, kind of a, as a reference to tell me when I bought the album and what store I bought it in. I bought this at Sam Goody uh, in July of 1987 at 6.34 p.m., if you must know. And I like that, and I do that even now. Um, the problem is some of these things, you know, with Amazon, you get a, you know, 8.5 by 11 page, and by the time you fold that and try to cram that into a CD booklet, the CD booklet won't close. Uh, but, you know, and, and back in the days, and you know, that's, that's the full receipt there, you know, and the receipt wasn't 9 inches long or, you know, 15 inches long like you get in some stores now. And it was kind of a good reminder, you know, because Sam Goody's is nobody would guess it would be gone. Uh, 1987, 6.34 p.m. on July 11th. That's where I was, and that's what I was doing. No big surprise to anybody who knows me. Um, another one. When was this written? Uh, recorded October 1983, Heavy Heart. Probably, I, I like the last one, too. Um, I, I got two albums for second favorite uh, for Carla Bly, and, and that was the last one I showed, and this one, too. Um, Heavy Heart, which I also have on, on a CD, of course. And again, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight-piece band, uh, a lot of the same guys, Victor Lewis on drums, Manolo Badrina, um, percussionist, he played with Weather Report and everybody, Kenny Kirkland on piano, the late Kenny Kirkland, who played uh, with um, Marsalis Brothers, uh, Gary Valenti, uh, Steve Slagle, horn player, uh, who did I miss? Steve Swallow, naturally, on, on electric bass. Carla and Hiram Bullock on guitar. Uh, this time, I have to bite my tongue and eat my words because look at this. There's some synthesizer on here played by Carla. I don't... This could be the only... I don't recall her. That's pretty rare, you know. But again, I listen to these albums mostly uh, in my computer because I've copied the CDs in there. And I don't have, obviously, the booklets in front of me when I listen to a lot of them. But there's not a lot of synthesizer on here. I don't recall she ever played any. But once again, she's playing um, she's playing organ. And uh, she's got, she got Kenny Kirkland to play the piano parts. And usually Carla plays piano herself. So this is a little odd period for her. But I love organ. And I love the electric organ. And I love you know that sound that not too many people use anymore. Uh, Hiram Bullock, once again, getting in some guitar solos in here. And it works. It works. I, I don't know. It's pure genius. I don't know if he was... I think those solos were improvised. Um, and they're aggressive stuff, you know. He didn't alter his musical direction regardless of who he played with, it seems. Now we get to my favorite one. This is, this is a Desert Island Carla Bly disc. And this is... Everybody has said it's funny. This is the, the most... This is an example of I love the albums by an artist that everyone seems to hate. Hate might be a strong word, but everybody kind of dismisses this one because this is the most accessible. Now, it took me a long time to learn the difference um, in music between accessible and commercial. Accessible is, you know, she didn't really change her outlook very much musically, uh, but this, the music on Night Glow, this particular album, is 
lacking the difficulty that a lot of her compositions have, and a lot of it's really pretty. Um, but apart from subtle those subtle changes, and they are subtle changes, everything else is there. You know, she's written charts for the band. Um, it's a fairly big band, um, and an interesting lineup too. And it's just that the out there stuff, she seemed to have intentionally dropped it for most of the compositions on this album. And maybe because I have a little bit of difficulty getting into some of her stuff, uh, this is such a pretty, beautiful, well-recorded album, and the arrangements are fantastic. There's, a, there's a, a, a horn section in here that plays in the background that very much reminds me of the type of writing you would hear and it would go by you, kind of, in um, like movie or television soundtracks from the 60s, where they used uh, the LA studios became flooded with um, jazz musicians in, in America, obviously, I'm talking about. And um, the soundtracks were also written by jazz musicians who, you know, because jazz was losing its popularity, a lot of those guys headed into the studios. And they ended up writing uh, music for movies and television shows. And if you listen to the music, which half the time, you know, when and if I watch these shows, I'm paying as much attention to the music as I am what's going on in the storyline. Um, you hear some very well written out charts. And when I say 60s, I don't mean it sounds dated, but it was a, there was a style to this that is so beautiful that I wish, I wish I could find more like it. I wish she had done more like it. Um, the basic band, Steve Swallow, once again, who's the guy that's sitting in the chair, he's She's lighting a cigar for him. Um, Carla on organ and synthesizers, again, and I'm amazed because I really don't hear the synthesizer sound. It totally went by me that she actually does play synthesizers. She's got um, Larry Willis uh, playing the piano, which, again, is a, an unusual thing because Carla usually plays piano herself, and also a bit of electric piano. And I also, as much as I've listened, I don't recall hearing electric piano on here. Uh, Victor Lewis on drums, and again, Manolo Badrina on percussion, which is pretty much the lineup of the last album, and Hiram Bullock again on guitar. This is the sweetest in terms of hearing his guitar. He doesn't get a lot of solo space, but he does some really nice things, and he does one or two s kind of subtle um, overdub harmony things that I'd never heard him do elsewhere either, that are actually really, really pretty. This, more than anything else, is the album where I heard him play that made me try to find more stuff by him, and I never found anything quite where he played quite like this. You know, he's got, at times, that aggressive sound, but he's also got this, this subtle thing going on. And, um, you know, I was, I was surprised, because I, I knew who he was at this point, because he had been in the Letterman Band in the early 80s, and I saw him from there. Now, this has a one, two, three, a five-piece backing, in addition to those one, two, three, four, six musicians, there's a five-piece horn section that plays those really, really, really beautiful charts that I was talking about. And there's a couple people that I'm not familiar with in the horn section. Uh, Tom Malone, who's a trombone player, David Taylor, who's a bass trombone player. But the next three guys are huge, huge guys in the, in the jazz world, which amazes me. John Clark on French horn, who did his own? Who did one fantastic album from ECM? Carm, you know it. Um, and and he recorded a, a couple things as a leader. But um, again, I think he's mostly a for hire guy in ensembles, or he's a studio musician. Randy Brecker on trumpet and flugelhorn, and, you know, which is just out of left field um, to me. And even more out of left field, Paul McCandless from the band Oregon is playing oboe, English horn, soprano, tenor, and baritone saxophones, and bass clarinet, and yet he's not even a, a featured soloist. He doesn't even solo on this. He's listed as the, um, in the section of kind of like, here's the additional musicians, and I'm assuming that those additional musicians are the guys that are not soloing. Uh, they're strictly playing those charts, and even though you probably won't be able to read it, up here you've got the primary band folks, which are the six people that are in the band. And down here are the five horn players. So you can see they're in smaller writing. Usually that's significant because um, that basically shows you that they're, you know, they're, they're playing written parts. They're not soloists. They're not featured players. Um, but those are some damn big names. Um, and this is my favorite thing by her, and I could not buy this fast enough on, on CD. And it's weird. It goes in and out of... It seems to go in and out of print where you can't get copies, and then you can, and then you can again, you know, that kind of thing. So I bought these, you know, the ones that I could get on CD, which I'm showing to you, just to prove that, yes, I do support them. And going, going from there, 
there's a obviously a direct, as I mentioned, correlation between now because um, Carl and Steve Swallow have been a couple for many years. Um, and here's a duets album, and this is just Carla on piano and Steve Swallow on his electric uh, bass from uh, recorded in 1988. This one is it's a little hard for me to get into because. Um, this is a combination that would work if they were playing kind of pretty music or jazzy music, but it's weird. But she took her whole oddball writing approach to writing, you know, larger band pieces and um, does it all just on piano. So the pieces, again, are very angular. It's not an easy one to get into, actually. Um, but continuing on that thread... I'm skipping ahead now. That's that's really all. That's just about all I have by Carla. Um, but Steve Swallow comes out with a solo album at this time. When was this? This is uh, '87. I don't know. Yeah, he recorded in '86 and '87. And he titles the album Carla, but it's a Steve Swallow solo album, and Carla plays on it. Almost exactly the same band as on the Carla Bly album. They were all part of one big family at this point. Um, so the Carla Bly album from that period of time, uh, Hiram Bullock plays on this again on guitar, Larry Willis is on piano, Victor Lewis on drums, Don Elias on percussion. So this was recorded, I think it was the Heavy Heart album that had this lineup, pretty much with that same lineup. Here he also has um, three um, string players, uh, two violins and a cello player as well. As a matter of fact, the cello player played on a Chikori album. I remember, I recall the name. This is really good. This is um, next to that Nyklo one, which I said is the most accessible one, which all those compositions were by Carla. All these compositions are by Steve Swallow, but it's very, it's a very complimentary album to the Nyklo albums. This is probably my second favorite thing. If I was going to lump them together, which may not be fair, but if I was going to, uh, I kind of put this at like number two in terms of my favorite albums done by the two of them. And uh, going on to uh, a, a disc, uh, September, November, 1991, Steve Swallow, just an album called Swallow. And again, uh, this is did, uh, Steve Swallow on bass, Steve Kuhn on piano, who, who some folks may know. He was you know recorded for ECM. Carla plays organ on this. Carla's daughter... Uh, with Mike Mantler, the trumpet player, her former partner, Karen Mantler, plays synthesizer and harmonica on here. Uh, Hiram Bullock again on guitar. Doesn't play much on this. Uh, Don Elias on percussions. Robbie Amin on drums. I'm not familiar with him. Uh, guest, guest, though, is uh, John Schofield on guitar and Gary Burton on vibraphone. And this is from 91. This is this is pretty good, but the, the one I showed you, the album titled Carla by Steve Swallow, that's my favorite of his, I think. That and Home... Uh, which I forgot, damn it, you know, I always do this. I forgot to pull a vinyl. I actually have it sitting right back there, too. Uh, the Steve Swallow uh, album he recorded for ECM called Home, which had Sheila Jordan, I, I'm pretty sure Sheila Jordan, singing vocals. Uh, it was, there were songs that Steve Swallow wrote to the poems of Robert Creeley, I believe it was. And that's one of those I should have shown. I, did I show it? Um, it's one of the ones I missed on CD that I wish I had. That's a really good album, too. That's a really good album. Um... More Steve Swallow. Here's a di here's a different different one. December '96. The reason this is different is because Carla doesn't play on this, and they're still together, as far as I know. Um, but this is one of the first Steve Swallow things you'll see in many a year that doesn't have Carla on it. Uh, Chris Potter on tele on tenor saxophone, who's gone on to record um, as a sideman on numerous ECM sessions. And Mick Goodrick on guitar, who I was going to add into this group of musicians, of uh, how I got you know from one to the other. But I have so many of his albums that um, I decided it would make the video too long. Steve Swallow on bass, Adam Nussbaum on drums, who played um, with, um, amongst other people, John Schofield. And again, this is good, but Steve, it's interesting. Uh, Steve and Carla are probably a good couple because he, he writes very angular type of things uh, as well. Not always easy to predict where they're going to go. And not not a solo album, really, but this is a particular standout, so I decided to show it. And I, I'm totally unfamiliar with this pianist, uh, this lady, Deidre Rodman, who is uh, fairly young. So, I mean, this is early in her career. Um, and when is this album from? Not that long ago, 2008, I want to say. 2008, yeah. 
acoustic piano, and uh, apparently this this young lady is a fan of Steve Swallow because she asked Steve Swallow to come and play in the album, and the only other instrument person on the album is Steve Swallow on bass. So it's, it's duets, uh, acoustic piano, and Steve Swallow on bass, and very different from the duet Carla Bly and Steve Swallow album because her writing is prettier. Uh, this is pretty accessible stuff in a good way. Very pretty, very well recorded, uh, very obscure. I don't even know how I found out about this. Uh, Twin Falls is the name of it. And most of the pieces are by Deirdre Rodman. There's one co-composition uh, w between the two of them. But they also play three of Steve's uh, solo compositions. Domino Biscuit being one of them, which is one he recorded more than 20 years prior to this. So it's, it's a tune of his that's got a lot of legs, and it's been recorded in numerous situations. Um, and as a matter of fact, that Domino Biscuit to Domino Biscuit track was recorded here. And I'm showing this for, for basically the reason this is a, a co-led album. And I love this idea, duet album. Just two musicians, not playing live, but rather recording, uh, you know, using overdubbing, but playing all the instruments themselves, no other guests. Now, the reason I'm showing this is because this is a Gary Burton and Steve Swallow album. Uh, because um, Steve Swallow played for many, 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 many years with Gary Burton. If you picked up a Gary Burton album anywhere from the early 70s to the probably mid-80s, um, Steve was on it. You just knew that you didn't even have to look. So they were, they were partners for a long time. This was recorded in May 74, so this is an oldie, 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 which I have on disc somewhere, in compact disc. It's weird. They didn't reproduce the colors when they... They, they did the cover, but they didn't... Um, the same cover when they reproduced it on compact disc, but for some reason, they didn't do the colors. I don't know why. They put this, like, brown, sol this one solid color brown. Very strange. I've never seen that before. But um, this is kind of... This is easier to get into. Little, It's a little dated sounding. Uh, it's an ECM album, but it doesn't have that ECM sound, and, and at first I wondered why, and it was because it was not recorded. Uh, ECM uses one of, like, two recording studios and one of two engineers for almost all of their jazz albums, and this was not recorded in either one. This one was recorded actually in Massachusetts and it was a uh, different you know, recording engineer and everything so the sound isn't really as good as most of those ECM albums. Uh, it was mixed by their, the primary engineer that records uh, like in Oslo, Norway is the big place where they normally record um, ECM albums. It was mixed by that engineer but not recorded by his and you can tell the sound isn't quite as good. I don't know what those guys do, you know, that, that magic that they do in those recording studios they use but they're really fantastic. This is an interesting album. There's no drums on here. Steve Swell also plays piano in addition to electric bass and um, Gary Burton plays vibraphone and marimba and also plays organ on this. It's an interesting kind of kind of more intimate album of theirs. It's a bit like the Gary Burton albums if you take out the if you take out the drums and the piano and the saxophone or guitar or whatever he was using at the time. So it's like a stripped down Gary Burton band album, which I recommend if you like the Gary Burton stuff. For the sake of completeness, um, I just wanted to show. Um, because he had played on one of the Carla Bly albums that I showed, the Social Studies album. Michael Mantler, who was a trumpet player, who, uh, I forget where, he originates from somewhere in Europe, and he lived in the States for many years and went back to Europe, apparently now, um, has recorded himself uh, quite a lot, especially in the 70s, or at least the stuff from the 70s was very much visible here, because he was living here and getting it released here. Now when he comes out with a release that's much more obscure, and again, I have another Michael Mantler disc and I can't find it. Uh, that's a much more recent thing that he did just with, uh, just I think it's just Mike Mantler and Don Preston on synthesizers, something called Alien, and it's an album I only got recently, and I don't know where I put it. Um, but that's just a duet. This is an interesting thing. Here's a, an album uh, where uh, Mike Mantley used the words of Samuel Beckett, Harold Pinter, and Edward, Edward Gorey, and set them to music. And, and this was recorded in February 87. Um, and set those to music and had Jack Bruce sing them, the, the bassist you know, of Cream or you know, whatever you know him from, the rock bassist. Uh, vocalist Jack Bruce sings the words from those poems that were set to music by Michael Mantler. 
The rest of the band is kind of interesting, too. Mike Mantler plays trumpet. Ricky Fenn on guitar, who, if you know the uh, British group 10CC, was a member of theirs at one point. And I think he's a studio musician, um, because he disappears. Uh, He he co-owned a recording studio in England, which he still may do, um, with Nick Mason, the drummer from Pink Floyd, who plays on here, oddly enough. One of the few side projects I've ever seen Nick Mason play on is with uh, Mike Mandler and Carla Bly. Uh, He's produced albums before. He co-owned a studio with Ricky Fenn, the guitarist on here, who played with 10CC, and apparently they they did a lot of uh, commercial jingles, apparently. They did one movie soundtrack, which the soundtrack wasn't released, but it was an American um, suspense thriller back in the late 80s. that I looked for for many years, and they just—they never bothered to release the soundtrack of it. I never saw the movie, but uh, I would have bought the soundtrack. Nick Mason and Ricky Fenn did an album together, uh, pretty much just the two of them under Nick Mason's name. That wasn't bad. It was, it was, you know, maybe more of a progressive thing, but uh, some interesting pieces on there. Um, hell of a band. Uh, Don Preston, the synthesizers on here. Oh, I didn't even realize that. I was talking about Don Preston playing on the other Michael Mantler disc that I have. And uh, John Greaves uh, plays bass and piano on here. John Greaves, if you're a fan of Canterbury uh, era progressive rock from the 70s, John Greaves kind of came in and went out of a whole bunch of those bands. Uh, associate like with people like David Dave Stewart, the keyboard player Dave Stewart, and stuff like that. So this is interesting. You know, you've got uh, Jack Bruce from the rock world, John Greaves, kind of, kind of from the rock world. I said John Greaves was essentially more of a jazz musician hanging out in the rock world, and Nick Mason from Pink Floyd, um, Ricky Ricky Fenn. There's a lot of rock, kind of rock oriented musicians on here, but the music isn't really rock oriented, from what I recall. And again, for the sake of completeness, just to show uh, the family association, there's Karen Mantler, who is the daughter of Carla Bly and um, Michael Mantler with one of her own solo albums. This is on Virgin. I'm surprised she got a contract with Virgin. Um, And you can't see her face on here, but you want to see somebody that looks like she was cloned from her mother. She She looks like Carla Bly's twin. Partially, it helps that they wear their hair the same way. And, uh, oh, that's it. I thought I had something else. Still, this went much longer than I wanted it to. I'm sure I'm missing stuff. I'm missing showing one of those Mike Mantler discs. Um, And this is hardly a career overview for any of the folks I showed. Not for Mike Mantler, not really for uh, Steve Swallow or or Carla Bly. But um, I just wanted to show maybe my favorites or the ones that that affect me the most. And uh, that Night Glow from Carla Bly, that's one of those albums I couldn't live without. And uh, an interesting, interesting group of musicians that are all still out there and playing. So, guys, um, you know, I don't know what I'm coming back with tomorrow or the next day. I'm going to try to give you tomorrow off. I say that every day. But, um, you know, all this is dependent on what I can find. All these discs I just found today um, going through my stack of stuff. And, uh, you know, I have plenty of ideas, but I can't find the discs to support the, you know, what I want to show. So, you know, what I'm going to show has more to do with what I can find than anything else, probably. Okay, guys, uh, appreciate you watching again. And watch as the shelves fill up slowly. Okay, thank you for all your kind comments and everything else, guys, and I'll be seeing you soon. Take care.